Johnny, you want to kick us off? Uh, yes, yes. So welcome everyone uh, to our Teach In The Teach Out space. Again, um, uh, Prof. Johnny, a lot of folks don't be here in the DU community. Prof. Johnny, Johnny Rocket can't stop it. Uh, Dr. Ramirez, <laughs> I don't know how many different intros that I could give myself, but really honored to be here in this space uh, with my amazing colleagues and community here at uh, DU. Uh, just again, wanna open up space on honoring the affirmation or the intention of the space. The space was started two years ago with students uh, really wanting to reclaim a space uh, with faculty and with community and where they could be able to be able to build, share knowledge, share ideas, share reflection, hold space for one another, but really kind of find a third space here in the university space. And which is kind of really beautiful about, I think that intention was initially was supposed to be outside in the greens. And we had the speaker and the mic and we were getting ready to go a little bit old school. But as we trans, uh, trans in, transitioned into COVID, we went virtual. And what we found is that we still had high levels of engagement Community still came out and, 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 and came out for one another, show love and support for one another. So today we want to honor those uh, intentions and continue that work, you know, around building our movement and organizing around um, the Stop the Asian Hate, uh, you know, kind of campaigns and mobilizations going on and um, finding a space to find that sacred interconnectedness to one another. I think in academia does a good job of siling to us, but when we could come together for these moments to connect and build, I think in many ways we're, 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 we're putting de decolonizing intentions, like we're really putting uh, those ideas supported with action. So with, with that being said, um, uh, again, we'd like to open up the space and I'd pass the mic over to our presenters and facilitators. Thank you, Prof. Johnny. And, and thanks all for being here and for folks who are watching this in the future. Um, I, I know St uh, Stephanie is, is my colleague and we're, um, we've been talking a lot in the past just about doing like political education in a really complicated Asian American and heterogeneous Asian American community and how do we kind of really um, inspire broader ideas of liberation that are informed by solidarity. And so for us, this is really fun because we're kind of getting to experiment with different approaches and ways to engage and present information. So thank you folks who are here and watching and kind of being uh, our guinea pigs in a sense. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen. Something always like goes wrong when I do this. Okay, I think it's good, right? You all see the slide? Um, yeah, so in our short time together today, um, you know, what my part will be, and, and Stephanie has um, her own dimension that she's gonna focus on, but I wanted to use this time today to really uplift grassroots community organizers and scholars, you know, AAPI and other folks who are arguing that we need to understand, you know, hate incidents within broader systems and structures of violence. And so these are really folks who have, you know, long histories of organizing and building power. And, um, you know, this argument is that really that we should be thinking about these hate incidents really in solid solidarity with Black, Latinx, Indigenous and other communities who have really been most impacted by structural violence. Um, for me, this has been really interesting because I'm a postdoc at the Social Movement Support Lab under IRISE, and we really support grassroots organizations that have been working to essentially defund the police, to uh, divest from criminalization, and to invest in the social supports that our communities need to be safe and to thrive. And for me, you know, a lot of these spaces are because of who's most impacted. They're led by Black and Brown folks, Black, Latinx, Indigenous, Pacific Islanders, Southeast Asian, North African. And sometimes the role in the, the, of different Asian Americans and, for example, East Asians, there's kind of a question there, you know, of like, where do our communities stand and what does solidarity and active solidarity for us look like? Um, and so I think today is part of that, that kind of conversation. Um, and so, you know, I do want to uplift some of these perspectives, even though some of the legislation that I'll be speaking about has already passed, I still think there's an important role for us to be um, on the lookout for it, to be able to push back and to think about what are the alternatives that we want if we're in a position where we don't feel like, for example, hate crime legislation is kind of the best response. Um, Stephanie, do you want to just introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you so much, May. Um... Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Stephanie, um, pronouns she, her, 
And I just want to first uh, give a big thank you to all the DU faculty and staff who made this possible. I'm super excited to be able to talk. Um, as, as we were mentioning earlier, it's the end of the quarter for me at UCLA. Uh, I'm exhausted, but um, really, really, really jazzed uh, to be here to talk to folks. Um, definitely given me a boost of energy um, amongst the grading that now I have to do. So, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I think May, uh, I think, thank you definitely to uh, May for, for also facilitating this opportunity as well. Um, and, you know, I don't have much to add because I think May, you put it absolutely beautifully, but um, I think in terms of how I'm sort of coming at this, um, I think in a lot of ways, I'm being kind of selfish and be taking part of this, this talk because a lot of it is a, a rumination on how I've been responding to uh, contemporary violences that we've been going, we've been witnessing. Um, you know, the past couple months, years, et cetera, you know? Um, and so um, I really, when May, you know, presented this opportunity to me, I was like, absolutely. I would love to be able to talk a little bit more through my ideas. Um, um, and I completely agree. It's just sort of uh, uplifting and, and thinking through really accountable forms of solidarity um, and sort of like a clear articulation of how to do so, I think, is something that we're all, all thinking through and how to do. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, again, thank you all for being here and thank you all the folks who made this happen. Um, and uh, yeah, looking forward to the, uh, the upcoming chats that we will have together. Yes, so there's, um, we've uh, put together a Google Doc that has a bunch of the articles that we'll be talking about today, both um, academic and, and public pieces. And so if you want to reference those, you can go to this um, tinyurl.com slash June 3 teaching. I think it is um, case sensitive. So some of the questions that we're going to be really thinking about today is how do we understand and define violence against APIs? What are some, of course, there's many more, what are some of the root causes? What are the implications for how we define solutions? Um, why and how should those solutions um, be really rooted in solidarity within and between racialized communities? And then what does um, accountability look like? How might one grapple with accountability when responding to violent moments? For whom are certain asks and demands being made and at what costs? And so before we get into it, you know, I, I know it's been a couple of months and unfortunately the way that the US works, there's so much constant violence that sometimes we forget the incredible violence that happened a few months ago because we're constantly grappling with these horrible incidents over and over and over again. And so just to remind us of, um, you know, the, the preciousness and irreplaceability and sacredness of lives, you know, I just didn't want to remind us um, of those whose lives were stolen in the Atlanta shootings, as well as the lives of folks who were lost in um, Indianapolis. And, and since then, unfortunately, um, folks whose lives have been stolen by state and state sanctioned uh, and vigilante violence. So um, what will we be talking about today? Um, so, you know, one thing I really want to remind us of is that there's no one response that's been coming from AAPI communities about how we understand and respond to hate violence. Um, so we've seen, for example, um, actor Daniel Day Kim and Daniel Wu's call for a reward to turn in those who committed certain incidents, um, which I'll point out that many API organizers in the Bay Area condemned because they pointed out that putting a bounty on a black man is you know, something that is very concerning and could lead um, to loss of life. Um, I believe about two weeks ago, um, this COVID-19 hate crimes uh, was passed uh, through both houses, um, led by Senator Maisie Hirono, Congresswoman Grace Meng, Judy Chu, and others. Um, so this would do things like assign a point person at the Department of Justice to expedite review of COVID-19 related hate crimes, um, provide guidance, and some have pointed out more resources to law enforcement to respond to and encourage reporting of anti-Asian hate crimes, and issue interagency guidance on hate crime reporting. The very same week, I think right before this legislation was passed, 
um, more than 85 AAPI, LGBTQ, and other Black, Indigenous, and people of color organizations um, actually released a statement opposing the, pa the passage of this hate crime legislation. So, you know, so why is that? Um, so to get into some of the reasons as to why these organizations have really been opposing hate crime legislation, you know, first of all, I just want to say, like, uh, um, I don't want to make anyone feel like bad um, for, for supporting this, because I think it's understandable, right? It's like these terrible things happen and there's this desire for a response or for accountability or for justice, however it is that we have been socialized to define justice. Um, however, you know, there's, there's also been a lot of discourse that's really drawing upon abolitionist understandings um, to really question this hate crime framework. Um, so, for example, there's longtime queer um, organizers and scholars, folks like Kay Whitlock, who have asked us to question this focus on hate crimes and framework of hate crime legislation. Um, Kay Whitlock and others argue that this framework assumes that hate is rooted in something that's purely individual, that is vigilante, that is sort of an irrational or pathological prejudice. And Whitlock and others argue that this really detracts from the broader structures and power and institutional practices. And so um, if someone uh, in the Google Doc, for those who just joined, joined us, there's um, a Google Doc with some of these articles, which I'll uh, share in a little bit again. Um, but in this interview that I linked, Kay Whitlock argues that, you know, what we think about as hate violence or supposedly violence directed at vulnerable and marginalized groups is actually not something that is abhorrent to respectable society. Um, respectable society has actually provided what Whitlock argues are the models, policies, and practices that already marginalize people of color, queer folks, disabled people, and women. And so Whitlock argues that this hate fr frame disappears considerations of structural violence and substitutes in the place the idea that there are these crazed extremists. And so this critique is really echoed in the statement that I just mentioned by those 85 plus organizations really opposing hate crime legislation and pointing out that this focus on supposed, you know, vigilante, crazed vigilantes doesn't change the structural conditions that has actually normalized this kind of violence. Okay, um, so to just jump in a little bit here to thinking about limitations of hate crime frameworks, um, I want to sort of think a little bit, uh, kind of uh, uh, use this as a place to sort of reassess the various campaigns and responses that um, Asian American communities have had to the ongoing hate crimes and uh, murders in Atlanta, as um, they mentioned, um, and sort of also using this space to sort of consider the questions around the failures of citizenship, belonging, and the American state. Um, these are some really, really like lofty concepts to critique, and I just spent the whole quarter doing that with a bunch of students. Um, so I could only, you know, spend the next 10 minutes or so kind of uh, just gently scratching the surface of why we can do that, I think, when we think uh, uh, beyond the hate crimes, so to speak. Um, so in order to do so, um, I asked, how might one grapple with accountability in response to violent moments such as these? And how do we make sure to keep centered the question for whom are these asks and demands being made and at what cost? Um, in order to help sort of tease out this question, I want to briefly turn to some context specifically regarding hate crimes, racial profiling, and the limitations of citizenship and belonging. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about this article uh, titled The Citizen and the Terrorist written by legal scholar Letty Volk, uh, who was pictured here. Uh, this article was written in 2002, so it was in the wake of 9-11, um, and she writes about the logics in uh, the massive uptick in racial profiling hate crimes committed against Arab, Muslim, Middle Eastern, and South Asian people during this time. Um, something that's really important about the project that or her work um, is that she explicitly connects instances of quote unquote individually committed hate crimes, uh, which include moments like people being attacked, people's headscarves uh, with headscarves um, being also attacked, uh, children being harassed in school, um, to moments of state regulated or legalized modes of racial profiling, um, as well as the broader so-called war on terror. Um, so just also to clarify too, um, 
what exactly were these moments of legalized modes of racial power? profiling. Uh, Volt goes in like great detail of multiple ways in which this was happening post 9-11. Um, but some examples that she offers was uh, subsequent to September 11th, um, she writes 1,200 individuals had been swept up into detention. The purported basis for the sweep was to investigate and prevent terrorist attacks, and none of the persons arrested and detained had been identified as engaged in terrorist activity. Um, she also talks about the so-called dragnet, or when 5,000 investigatory interviews of individuals of Middle Eastern or Islamic backgrounds were conducted, um, as well as sort of the massive increase of policing of brown folks uh, through the Immigration and National Naturalization Service. Um, these are just a few, again, just a few examples that uh, Volp um, brings up when talking about the legalized modes of racial profiling uh, following 9-11. So in this article, in other words, uh, Volpe kind of asserts that hate crimes are not merely individualized moments of violence, but that they are deeply contextualized and connected to broader structural violences, as May uh, already put forth. Um, so it's also important to note that at this time, the logic of policing um, Middle Eastern, Arab, Muslim, and South Asian people through both state-sanctioned activity and individual action in face of so-called national crisis became solidified. So in other words, this idea of like protecting state interests and safety became justification for these racialized violences that manifested in hate crimes and racial profiling, um, a logic that undoubtedly has continued on into the contemporary moment. Um, she also even goes into explaining a little bit that that perpetrators of post 9-11 uh, hate violence were often read as just sort of like misdirecting their anger rather than being like of like committing violent acts of malicious intent um, and sort of explains why uh, moments of racial profiling hate violence had actually been collapsed into forms of patriotic duty. Uh, she brings up the case of Balbir Singh Sodhi, uh, a Sikh Indian killed in Mesa, Arizona, um, whose murderer when arrested reportedly shouted, um, I stand for America all the way. So in other words, um, hate crimes are not merely hate crimes. And in the case of the murder, murderer of Sodhi, he wasn't, as May states, extreme or pathological. Um, his actions were clearly motivated by his interpretation to the broader question of the nation, what it needs, who belongs, and who does not. Furthermore, um, Volp asserts that it is really important in moments like these, um, in moments of like, I guess, what we call a national crisis, um, to interrogate the structures that are often taken for face value, including citizenship, nationalism, and the nation itself. Um, as she suggests, citizenship was a mechanism to police even those who were seemingly protected by it. As Volpe states, um, many of those who were racially profiled were citizens of the US themselves through either birth or naturalization. And though they were seemingly theoretically um, entitled to formal rights, they were not considered citizens as a matter of identity, identity in that they no way represent the nation. And so it, she's thinking a lot about this sort of precarious state in which a lot of these uh, Middle Eastern, Arab, Muslim, and South Asian folks occupied in the sense that they, because they weren't read as citizens, even though they were, they, had, uh, they were subjected to these different forms of violence. Um, so in other words, uh, by examining the failures of citizenship or the way that those who are seemingly protected are actually not show just how precarious and conditional it is to be a person of color in this country. Um, I'm not arguing. I also just want to take a quick pause here and just sort of mention that I don't think Volpe or myself are arguing that problems will be solved by clarifying the category of citizenship, um, nor am I saying that violence against people who aren't citizens is justified. Um, what I am uh, suggesting is that the way that the country has, as May stated earlier, structurally normalized violence through various ways, including the legal categorizations like that of citizen, uh, needs to be interrogated. Um, May, could you get the next slide? Thank you. Um, and to sort of backtrack a little bit to, um, and to sort of connecting to the broader question at hand in which we're talking about in this presentation, um, Volpe also mentions that because citizenship and the protections that citizenship seemingly offered was, is entirely precarious and conditional, especially for people of marginalized communities, uh, we saw during the post 9-11 moment, Middle Eastern, Arab and Muslim people who were, quote, uh, from Volpe, subject to potential profiling had to, as a matter of personal safety, drape their dwellings, workplaces and bodies with flags and often futile attempt at demonstrating their loyalty. So this was, I think, image that we are probably all actually pretty familiar with. Um, 
following 9-11. And it's still a rather necessary thing for people to do in moments of, as what I say, national crisis, that for those who are situated at the site of precarious citizenship must prove that they are Americans, whether that be in the ways in what they say, profess, or through what they wear. Um, and, you know, I'm not here to condemn individuals who have to do this to prove their Americanness, such as this, you know, an individual here in this picture. Um, oftentimes, these things are done literally out of the need to survive and live in face of such oppressive conditions. But I, what I do want to do is point to the catch-22 nature of what it means to be a person of color in this country, as well as the ways in which hate crimes and racial profiling are no way unique to specific situations and individuals. Um, deeply couched in moments of, um, but are instead deeply couched in moments of institutional and historical American violences. Um, in this country, there's like just inherently so much violence uh, that lies in the question of who counts as a citizen, who doesn't, who deserves to be protected, and who will have to pay for that protection. So yeah, so what does that then mean in the broader scope of what's happening right now in the face of the global pandemic and rising white nationalisms amongst other sorts of, you know, global economic, like environmental destruction. Um, I think first and foremost, we must not use these moments to affirm the state or in other words, affirm the violence that permeates, upholds and is committed by and in the name of the American state. Oftentimes how we may respond to these moments can replicate these violences committed against us and our communities because it's moments of fear, panic, terror, non-clarity and the resources and support we need are often lacking. So in other words, it's tempting to sometimes lean into language like I'm also an American or we belong and therefore don't hurt us as they are like literal pleas for safety or protection. Uh, but it's important for people using these discourses to take a pause and think about how these discourses themselves are inherently problematic. Um, next slide, please, May. Thank you. Um, so instead, right, we have to consider the limitation in terms of the category of the citizen. This is kind of a wrapping up of what I've been saying, um, right? Because of course, the concept of the citizen is premised upon problematic concepts of belonging, nationalism, and statehood. It's been weaponized against certain kinds of people, used as justification for structural violence. And as Wolf suggests, it's a really dangerous place to occupy for certain people because of its conditional and precarious um, uh, state. Alongside this, we need to interrogate our need and desire to belong. I mean, I have to talk about this a lot when I'm teaching Asian American studies and sometimes in particular Asian American students who are, you know, use a lot of discourses around like, I am Asian American, I should count as a citizen, I should be treated like what a citizen is. But rather than thinking about it in that way, I often think, what does it mean to continue to want to belong to a nation that has been bent on the ongoing destruction and decimation of marginalized people? Furthermore, uh, we must also interrogate our interpretations around safety, community, and support. When we talk about these ideas, we must ask who is being left out of these conversations, at whose cost are we making these demands, and whose interests are being protected. So in other words, um, I return back to the question of accountability um, in community responses to violent moments, and again, insist that the question for whom, um, insist that the question for whom are these asks demands being made and at what cost must remain at the center. Um, because if your sense of safety, for instance, is coming at somebody else's livelihood, then that does nothing but uphold the structural injustices and violence that continue to shape our world and communities. Um, so I think going off of that, I believe May is gonna talk a little bit now about the ideas around vulnerability. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, that, was, that was really brilliant. And um, yeah, it made me kind of wonder about to what extent um, solutions around policing and carcerality are linked to the sense of like belonging and citizenship too, which I'm sure folks have, have written about. But um, yeah, a lot of food for the thought there and thanks for just providing a, a broader um, framework for thinking about structural violence and this framework of questions to ask as well. Um, so I'm gonna just, um, that's right. Yes, there's a lot of Bruin representation here. I got my master's at UCLA, so I also identify with UCLA, even though I went to USC. I would rather claim UCLA. Okay, anyway, so um, <laughs> so just to kind of um, connect um, what Stephanie's been saying back to the specific context at hand, you know, many organizers, API and other um, BIPOC organizers have been pointing out that, you know, when we think about um, stopping hate against APIs, we have to really think about who is most vulnerable within 
this really broad kind of category, especially elderly folks, women, undocumented migrant workers, um, either sex or sexualized workers, for example. Um, Ai Jen Pu, the director of the National uh, Domestic Workers Alliance, pointed out, for example, the woman in Atlanta, you know, the um, really faced precarity as immigrant low wage workers. Um, and just this broader violence of undervaluing, lack of protection, poverty wages, and systemic uh, vulnerability. Um, and so, just to, you know, further uh, make the point that Stephanie and I have both been making. Ajin Pu argues that the logic that makes it acceptable to attack an older AAPI woman is the same logic that allows us to keep AAPI women in unsafe jobs, living in poverty without a safety net. Um, Kate Zen, an organizer with Red Canary Song, which is a grassroots collective of Asian and migrant sex workers, you know, also argues again, we need to understand the specificity of Asian massage workers as sexualized, um, whether or not they're actually sex workers, because that stigmatization and fetishization um, around sexualized work really increased their vulnerability to violence. Um, and then finally, within these links, I've also um, included an op-ed from Dr. Elena, uh, Elena Shi, who argues that you know um, massage workers, as um, many of them undocumented or as migrants, um, are also often harassed by police in raids that are coordinated with the Department of Homeland Security. And this can start detention and deportations against undocumented folks. And so for them, you know, as Stephanie asked, who feels safe? Um, for, for these workers, um, everyday threats of policing actually make them feel more, feel and materially more vulnerable. It's harder to report, poor working conditions, and just more challenging to seek redress for their needs. Um, and I think um, just from what Stephanie and I have been saying that, you know, um, trying to point out that there are certain types of violence that gets uplifted, but as Kamai Girls in Action pointed out, um, the very same day as Atlanta shootings, 33 Vietnamese folks were deported and separated from their families. And that kind of ongoing state violence and hate incidents hasn't received the same framing, but it should, right? And we also have this global apartheid and, and whatnot. And that is really also anti-Asian violence. So specifically why some of these organizations are really um, critiquing hate crime legislation and the further bolstering of law enforcement. So in the case, for example, of Red Canary Song, um, in addition to what I just pointed out, Red Canary Song was actually formed when in 2017, a massage parlor worker named Yang Song fell to her death when police were attempting to arrest her for allegedly engaging in sex work. Um, as Kate Zen points out, the NYPD has also extorted money and sexual services from Asian massage workers. And when these businesses ended up getting um, raided under the auspices of combating sex trafficking, um, you know, folks, in addition to ending up in ICE custody, also have assets seized or they're jailed and then find themselves out of a job. Um, something that I also learned recently is also you know, when, you know, Stephanie posed this question of like, who's protected or what does safety look like? And hate crime legislation, as much as I think the intention is to protect vulnerable folks, also doesn't get sort of enforced in the way that we might hope or think. Um, so in another piece that I linked, Jason Wu and James McMaster point out that in New York City, where several assaults of Asian victims have been reported to police, um, only one person has been prosecuted for an anti-Asian hate crime this year. And it was actually a Taiwanese man who was accused of writing anti-Chinese graffiti. Um, I think Stephanie and I are laughing because we know how Chinese people can be. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, um, and so, you know, the, the folks arguing this say that it's not just about sort of better or more intense enforcement. It's actually pointing out that, you know, there's all these structural barriers of reporting hate violence. And also that um, because of the way that we def define hate crimes, that actually a lot of times, um, for example, the Marshall Project found that Black folks are disproportionately accused of committing hate crimes. So Black folks make up 13% of the US population, but are accused of nearly 24% of hate crimes. White people are 60% of the population, but are accused of less than 53% of hate crimes. 
So there's another talk I watched by Tamara Knopper, which just talks about, you know, the hate, a hate crime is like an incident against any category of individuals. So even sort of so-called incidents against police officers or against white folks can be construed and prosecuted um, as hate crimes. And we know that black folks are really criminalized for all sorts of behavior. So this really fits into that broader pattern. And so Dean Spade argues that hate crime laws strengthen and legitimize the criminal punishment system, a system that targets the very people these laws are supposedly passed to protect. And so the, that statement of 85 plus organizations who oppose this legislation argue that this Hate Crimes Act contradicts Asian solidarity with Black, Brown, undocumented, trans, low income, sex worker, and other marginalized communities whose liberation is bound together. I think something that is important to recognize too is that even as we uplift and recognize who police viol violence and criminalization and incarceration impacts most, you know, especially black folks, especially brown folks, um, is that you know, Asian Americans are also impacted by police violence. Um, here, um, you know, you see folks like um, Christian Hall, um, Angelo Quinto, um, I remember CCAP. You know, are folks who were killed by police in, in several instances when they needed mental health support. And so I think we can certainly recognize who this impacts most and also recognize actually this, you know, I think what these organizations are arguing is it's also bad, you know, for a lot of AAPI folks. And we, um, we may experience both protection and a lack of criminalization for some of us. Um, and so, you know, um, it still, it still um, has an impact on us. And so I think it's this question of what it means to live in a broader society that relies on policing and criminalization as a solution in response to all problems. And that's something I've been talking a lot about with students in my class when we talk about abolitionist organizing, that it's not just about focusing on specific police incidents, but this system that we've set up where policing is a solution, so-called solution to everything. And what does that mean? And so again, I think this goes back to Stephanie's point, organizers um, from places like APEN, Asian Pacific Environmental Network, have, um, you know, in a broader abolitionist tradition have asked us to rethink what we mean by safety. Um, for example, thinking about safety in terms of strong social connection, access to all the resources and housing and food and health that we need, um, and in safety nets that are really preventive. When we think about who is most vulnerable within API communities, going back to the context that I was talking about, this means that addressing anti API violence means also addressing wage theft, creating safe workplaces, housing and healthcare services for victims that are in language, and really protection of migrant workers, um, especially migrant women workers. And, um, you know, having the right to organize when your rights are infringed. These are all broader solutions that don't kind of rely on, on further policing and criminalization. So again, um, uh, the last time I gave this presentation was like two weeks ago and the legislation had just be, been passed and people say, said, well, what do we do? It's already been passed, right? Um, so I think, you know, um, from the statement that I linked, um, and again, it's in the chat, um, you know, there's these demands from these organizations that I think are still relevant and that we can still support. Um, I think what's really important is to still continue to listen to grassroots organizations, lifting up the leadership of those most impacted um, on a day-to-day -day level, because they are the ones who are creating these alternatives. Um, and and um, asking for localities to redefine how um, they enact safety. But some of the demands, for example, from these organizations include shifting resources from law enforcement to communities. So for example, in Denver, I know there, there's this pilot program called STAR, which is modeled off um, this, this program called CAHOOTS, which sends non-police response to folks who are experiencing mental health crises or substance use issues. Um, and so they send like a medic and a, mentor, a mental or behavioral health specialist. Um, and very, I, I think in the pilot, I want to say they like never had to call police, or if so, they rarely did. And so these alternatives, you know, they are working and we're building um, evidence that they work. Um, and I think the other framing they point out is just to think about 
um, the role of anti-Blackness, anti-immigrant um, systems and policies and rejecting those proposals that are harmful for those who are most marginalized. So I think even though this legislation has been passed, um, you know, hate crime legislation and carceral responses will, will not go away as long as we have that as a dominant foundation um, for responses to everything. And so I think it is really important to just continue to support alternatives on the ground and organ organizations who are enacting a different way to be. Um, so I think, yeah, we, we have a little bit of time left and we can entertain any questions or discussion from audience members. And Stephanie has also come up with some really nice questions here. Um, just, I don't know, Stephanie, if you wanna kind of walk through them. Yeah, um, I think, you know, in scope of uh, what we've just presented, uh, the first question, um, that we could think about is, is, you know, as Americans or for those who are American or have some kind of relationship to the US, um, what are some values or beliefs that you have that you believe need to be um, interrogated? So I often ask this question for in my students in the class that I teach um, that, you know, it's very much about interrogating the mythologies of the United States. And I think that really gets to the heart of it all. But anyways, um, for the audience members who care to, chime in, what are some kind of values or beliefs do you feel need to be interrogated? Or maybe we could just like, just put them all out and then people can yes. ask questions or yes. respond to whatever calls to them. Okay, that sounds like a great idea, Bay. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, the other thing, the second one is sort of a feed, uh, is feeding off the first one where, um, you know, I'm really curious about the question around national safety and citizenship how they get constructed and proliferated. I mean, even in this sort of post-ish Trump um, world or whatever, um, you know, we could clearly see how concepts of safety, concepts of citizenship were mobilized extremely violently by Trump um, and his followers in a lot of ways. So uh, we'd love to hear more about folks and your thoughts around this. Um, uh, yeah, and then sort of the third one is kind of along the lines of this as well, um, and sort of considering how the limitation of hate crime legislations or limitation of sort of the hate crime framework that we've been talking about, how does that kind of allow us to reckon with the contradictions that make up the U.S. state? And again, um, this is, I think, I wrote these questions uh, basically having just finished teaching, so I think a lot of this are like questions I post to my students, but I'm very interested in the concept of, you know, the U.S. as a very contradictory site. Um, and I think when we critique stuff like hate crime legislation, it makes it very clear when those contradictions emerge. Um, and of course, the fourth question is, what other kind of questions or concerns remain? Um, we don't have to necessarily talk about these three questions either, the three first, the, the listed questions that we have here. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's what we've got here. Um, any thoughts or questions that people may have? I know everyone's got the the end of the quarter burnout fatigue. Um, can uh, either of you guys talk a little bit about um, how you think communicate uh, solidarity between groups can be communicated because. I believe that there's a lot of misconceptions about what we think of each other and mm -hmm. our aspirations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. And actually, um, right before this talk, I was on a, um, I was watching a Zoom uh, summit uh, that was um, by organizers in Oakland, um, including something called the Anti-Terror Police Project. Um, which has um, sort of a, a community-based uh, mental health responder program that I think is very much uh, cognizant of like white supremacy and needing to um, intervene and prevent 
um, police violence in response to, to mental health. And I bring that up because um, before the Atlanta shooting, some of these incidents were, you know, there were incidents that were, for example, in Oakland, Chinatown, and the perpetrator may have been like a, a Black individual. And that was bringing up a lot of stuff um, from, I think, like Asian American communities in the Bay Area that were very divergent, where there were some folks, you know, who um, really wanted, for example, like uh, Daniel Day Kim to um, have this police response. And then there's some Asian American API organizations who have a very long history of solidarity with Black uh, organizing, who were saying this, you know, our response should not be more police and our response should not be to send police after a Black man or to, for, for police to have this um, leeway to target any Black man they want under the auspices of this kind of bounty. So I think in terms of how solidarity is communicated, I think it's complicated because I think um, we can both speak to long histories of, of global and transnational solidarity. Um, for example, when I started out with my class on social movements this quarter, we started with the um, Third World Liberation Front uh, in SF State. And then, you know, things like uh, the connection between like Black Panthers and like Mao and like com Communist China. But the reality is that there's a lot of folks I mean, that's not that's not the majority unfortunately of i think i think you could say that safely of, of, of api communities in the us or in, in i don't know north america more broadly so i think how solidarity needs to be communicated is to both share that this is not something new that solidarity is something that has been enacted but to also acknowledge the ways in which sometimes for example east asians have enacted real harm um, on Black folks, on Latinx folks, on indigenous, you know, like that there are, I think, I think that we can't just say like, oh, that's not us. Because sometimes I hear that discourse come up in affirmative action, like, oh, it's not us, we don't stand for this. But the reality is there's parts of our community that are very conservative and like very much embrace white supremacy. And so I think part of solidarity is like actually trying to do the political education to organize against that. And it's really hard. Um, I mean, I think part of that is like, like, you know, I have cousins, I have family members who are very well-meaning, but they're like, well, why shouldn't we have more police to respond to? You know, they live in the Bay Area and they're like really wonderful people. They're like very rich though, you know? So like their experience is kind of limited. So I try to like use my own background to kind of just engage with them in longer conversation. And I think communicating solidarity means not just doing it in a moment of crises because people feel so much pain during these moments that they can't see beyond anything else. I think we have to do it on an ongoing basis. And so that's why I think, you know, Stephanie and I were talking about like, oh, this is kind of a random timing for this, but then we're like, maybe it's better because people can kind of take a step back. And I think that's what our goal is, is to just continue having those, those conversations. I think communicating solidarity needs to happen like all the time. Um, and it needs to acknowledge both yeah, how we've enacted it and also the realities of how we've, uh, parts of our communities have not been so great about it. Thanks for that question, Allison. Stephanie, was there anything you wanted to add on that? Yeah, I would love to jump in on that question because it is a wonderful, wonderful question and one that both troubles me and like I, I have to sit with a lot because I, I don't think I have a clear answer. Um, but I will love to babble my thoughts about this real quick. Um, so I will. Uh, so I think very much so and what May is saying, and I really appreciate what you had to say, May, because it does also help situate what I'm thinking about. But when it comes to like forming community solidarities, um, for me, a lot of times it is starting with like a lot of the work that we were, I think we're trying to think through in this presentation, which is like sort of troubling the frameworks in which we uh, uh, sort of, I'll speak for myself of being part of an Asian American community, um, troubling the frameworks that we use to construct our own personal communities, right? So like when we, I think in a lot of ways, Asian American communities do take concepts like citizenship and safety and, and and like stuff like that very much so for face value without thinking about what they actually mean as sort of the histories and violences that are attached to these concepts too. Um, so a lot of times I think I used to teach back in the day um, to our students be like, well, one of the number one steps for solidarity for me is always thinking about how our oppressions are linked, right? This idea that there is a structure of oppression in which we 
experiences these things um, in different valences and in different ways. But, you know, as the years have gone on, I'm like, there's something else more to that in, in that the case that a lot of times communities, and again, speaking specifically about Asian American community is that our proximity to like white supremacist power and violence, uh, we derive power from that ourselves as Asian Americans. And that's exactly what May was sort of saying. That's in how that's how we've been sort of implicated and sort of also responsible in committing these violences against other communities too. And so it's like, we are responsible for, uh, you know, for contributing to the oppressions of other people as well, you know? And so I think that's the, that's the thing I've been trying to push when I think about these questions, particularly with students, um, you know, and for instance, like I think why I was so I'm so hung up on this question around citizenship for Asian Americans because I do think it's an often it's, it's a question that people bring up in our communities like we belong, I am Asian and American, that kind of thing. And I'm like, why do you want to be? And that's so like settler, you know, like, like that's such a settler logic that you're enacting um, by by conceiving of citizenship in this way in this way rather than thinking like citizenship in the US basically means that you have to buy into its settler project to its capitalist like exploit exploitive projects the white supremacist project like you could you know go on and on and enlisting that and um I mean one other thing for me too is like for Asian Americans it's really important for us to unhinge our investments in American empire and like and like settler projects and like capitalist accumulation. Like there's so much of, you know, and I think I know it's complicated and I understand why. And I think we've talked about this in the sense, it's sort of the ways in which people have carved out how to survive in this country. You have to buy into these kinds of projects. And so um, in order to make solidarity is to kind of try to bring it back. It's like starting to unhinge these investments, start to unravel these invest investments and recognizing our complicities with the broader sort of um, violences that are committed by the American and like white nationalist American, you know, nation, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, I don't know, I'm not sure if I totally gave a clear, clear answer, but those are sort of my thoughts as to, uh, but, you know, where the conversation maybe begins. Um, it's an extremely complicated, I think, concept solidarity is. I mean, obviously, like we've been talking about it for decades and decades and decades and, you know, but, um, but yeah, those are those are sort of my thoughts. I um can I just say one more thing because Stephanie, you made me think of one more thing when you said our oppressions are interlinked because, um, you know that slide I had with the Asian American API young men who were killed by police. I mean, I think um, so. There's a really great article by Vivian Chung. I want to say it's in either Amerasia or Journal of Asian American Studies, looking at um, CAV, this organizing group in New York, and their work actually against police violence and how it's impacted um, Asian, you know, Black, Latinx, um, other communities in New York. And in it, she has this quote from Fred Moten, and I'm going to butcher the quote, but it's a really good quote because he basically says, you know, I just I need you to recognize that something is is killing you, even if it's killing you more slowly. You know, mm. so I think that's kind of like a good way of putting it. It's like, yes, we know that that this, the way that things are set up um, around policing as a response to everything is, is killing black and uh, black folks, you know, sort of most quickly, but it's also killing all of us in, in a sense, even if it's more slowly. And so I think you could recognize both, both of those things. Yes. Hi, Lisa. Hi. Um, thank you both for, for this great um, conversation. May, I'd love to hear more about your social movements class at another time. Um, I, I've been curious how, how that's gone. Um, I was hoping to maybe ask a slightly different question um, and one that um, I try to interrogate in a lot of my work. I know May, you do as well. And, and, and you actually just mentioned a moment ago a, a, um, a, 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 a panel or a Zoom session with uh, people in Oakland. My question is, um, what does this work look like, right? How, how do you sort of adjust and modify depending on the places or context where you are? So, you know, the, the demographics, um, the history, the energy of uh, organizing or mobilizing around these issues in Oakland is gonna be vastly different oh. than we are here in Denver. So, so how, do you, how do you account for that, but in a way that's still gonna be able to sustain um, and lead to the kind of change um, 
around uh, some of the incidents you all have been describing and, and talking about um, how that might lead to um, hate crime legislation, how we reckon with these issues um, that, you know, seem to be happening on the daily. Um, if you could just kind of speak to, to what that might look like, allowing for, for differences in where this work might be taking place. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question, Lisa. It's, it's a great question. And I have to say, you know, I'm pretty spoiled only having lived in LA and New York where I know there's, uh, it's gonna look different than Denver or Stephanie. I, I mean, Stephanie is based in Chicago right now, is that right? Or the, the suburbs of Chicago? I don't know. Actually, Stephanie might be able to speak to this better. I feel like I'm, I'm like really spoiled. <laughs> Um, but I do think that is really important, right? Because even thinking about, for example, the LA region, we have like Orange County. And in Orange County, what organizing looks like is really different because you have, for example, um, and there's been incredible, for example, immigrant rights organizing going on in places like Santana, um, very like um, intersectional, um, just like despite Orange County's regressive politics, like just just very, I think, radical. Um, and I think that's a real inspiration. Like, I think we need to, for example, invest more in Orange County and OC. Like, that is some real cross-racial organizing, for example, between Latinx and Viet and Southeast Asian folks that, that hasn't received as much attention. I think it's very LA-centric, um, generally, probably. Um, so I was going to say even just regionally, right, that in a place like Orange County, which is still has a lot of entrenched conservatism, and it's not as easy for, say, second generation Vietnamese or Southeast Asian folks to come out and say certain things um, because of this, you know, very real fear of anti-communism. Um, I think, yeah, I don't know if I can really answer this question. I think it's a really good one because I think it's real. I mean, also just, for example, you know, Stephanie, I'm sorry to out you, but we're both Taiwanese. And like, you know, there's like particular immigration histories that like um, mean that there's a lot of wealthy, you know, highly educated folks in our community who like um, may have a very sort of narrow paradigm. <laughs> um, and I think I have to do a lot of like translation of well, we might be able to talk about in other more radical AAPI, POC spaces, or in Asian American studies, or in ethnic studies, and really think about, okay, if I said this to my cousin, she's going to think I'm crazy. <laughs> like, she's going to be like, what are you talking about? I don't care. <laughs> like, you know, so I think even there's just like translation within our different communities and where they're at. But I don't know that regional and, and geographic one. St Stephanie, I don't know if you can speak to it coming from the Midwest, you know? Yeah, I can definitely try. I mean, I'll be, I'll totally admit that a lot of my politicization process and my organizing experiences have ha mostly happened in Los Angeles. Um, it's definitely been difficult out here in the suburbs. I've moved back home um, for, you know, because of the pandemic and stuff like that and need to be back home. Um, you know, and this is like, thank you so much, uh, Lisa, for your question. This was a, 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 like, 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 they said this is literally the question I think that a lot of organizers like literally have to ask like what does it mean to organize in context and in specificity of location and it's just like there's so many different things you have to keep in mind like yeah like class uh literal like historical context I mean something that I've been really struggling with too is understanding like like indigenous struggles that are like particular to each. So understanding like land sovereignty as a, in a different context in each area in which you're organizing, it won't look the same in every place. And that's something that, you know, I've been trying to work through like relocating back to Potawatomi land actually. So um, uh, exactly generational differences. And, you know, speaking specifically to Taiwanese Americans, cause like May said, I am Taiwanese American and it's just real struggle sometimes. <laughs> I could do a whole talk on that. Um, but like, um, you know, I think what's important when you when you go from place to place, like, I think it, for me, it's important not to like discipline anybody of either place based off of your other experiences, if that makes any sense to be like, okay, Chicago suburb people, like you're so stupid and like you're so limited worldview. Like I was in LA and it was incredible, blah, 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 you know? So it's like, for me, important not to put like, it's really easy to sometimes um, to fall into that. But like, 
I think for me, it's important to keep mind of like, not necessarily like kind of meeting where people are at, but like keeping my personal like values and my personal politics at heart and knowing what I, you know, what I want to know and like what I believe in and being like, I can just exactly what May is saying, I think like almost translate it into particular contexts um, that, you know. Um, oh, but right, speaking about Taiwanese Americans though, like it's so frustrating. And, and I think it's also like, I think it's all specifically identifying the needs of each community is really important. It's probably the first thing that you gotta do when you start organizing and like, I don't even mean just like literal needs, like that's come this, like, you know, matters of housing need to be addressed or literal, like matters of, um, you know, uh, policing levels and this community we address. I don't even mean just that needs, but I also mean like political needs too, where like if I'm talking to Taiwanese Americans or whatever, you know, like I, um, it's like, why are we so invested in capitalist accumulation? Like, why are our answers to like open small businesses? And like, why is that the thing that we all decide to do in response to like intense violence happening against Asian Americans right now, which is actually a true story. I know people who have done that. So like, um, you know, oftentimes I look to neighboring communities. So like, I've tried to take a lot of um, inspiration from Korean folks that I know who've organized and have brilliantly organized under like similar contexts where like there's similar military histories, mili uh, similar um, migration histories, similar ways in which people have settled, um, religious histories and stuff like that. And, and sort of looking towards the radical ways in people have organized in other communities. And I sort of try to think about it in the ways in which I'm situated in community too. Um, I think that's sometimes how I try to like toggle when I'm moving in different spaces and different places too. But um, I don't know if that's fully answered to your question, but I think that's, that's sort of how I think through stuff. No, it is, and, and it, it, I think the, the sort of shorter answer is it's very complicated, right? When, when you're, you're trying to do this work and you're navigating all these differences um, and also trying to, to find a point of commonality that, that might inspire people to, to uh, work together. So thank you, thank you both. Yeah. Thanks, thanks Lisa for putting it better. <laughs> I was like, well, like, yes, that. <laughs> I was like, we should have just said that. <laughs> But um, yeah, I do know that we're on time and just, you know, um, want to thank folks. I know we had an in intimate group, but still a great conversation. So thank you so much for, for joining and, and engaging. Um, really appreciate you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Yep. Thank you for the talk. Okay. That's wonderful. Thanks for coming. Thank you.